You're going to be glad I sat you down. <laughs> this is Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 through 11 and 17 through 26. Um, listen to the words of Solomon. I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. And yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And so I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me, all of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, and yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. And so my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. How's that for an upper for today? Make you feel good? Sounds like the words of a depressed person to me, um, which is why they actually kind of ring true for most of us sometime or another in our life. Because we all have days um, where life doesn't seem to measure up to our expectations. That's what was happening with King Solomon. King Solomon was the son of of David. Uh, he reigned from 970 uh, to 931 BC. He was the third of Israel's 
kings. Um, this is the testimony that you heard of an old man who's looking back on his life. When I counsel married couples, and I may have mentioned this already, so we're, I've been here three months, we're already repeating ourselves, but um, when, when I counsel uh, couples for, uh, who are planning to get married, one of the goals that I usually ask, uh, one of the questions that I usually ask are, what are your goals? And often I hear the same answer. Um, in fact, I remember one particular couple where the young woman said, oh, we just want to be happy. And I'm thinking, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, happiness and joy, joy is the topic of our sermon today, are kind of alike, right? In fact, happiness and joy are translated interchangeably in the Bible. But for our purposes, I want to uh, kind of redefine them just a little bit. So I want to talk about happiness. Happiness is circumstantial, okay? So happiness is the thing that happens when life is going good, when things are right, when expectations are being met, uh, maybe when a goal is being met. That's happiness. And the thing about happiness that you're going to figure out here is it's kind of fleeting, all right? It comes, it goes, it comes back. It's not consistent. The definition that I want to give you for joy is that it's independent of circumstances. Now that's a hard concept for us, all right? But let's think about it for just a minute. Think that God is so powerful that he can give you joy even when life isn't going well. He can give you joy when you're sad, he can give you joy when you're suffering from loss. He can give you joy in any circumstance, any circumstance. And we will go through some pretty horrific things in our life. In fact, Jesus said that in his own words, that there will be troubles. But there will also be him. And when we have him, we have joy in the midst of trouble. So we often think that reaching a goal will make us happy, and, and that goal might be to graduate, you know? I, I put all this hard work into school, I'm gonna graduate, I'm gonna be happy. Or when I finally get that promotion I've been counting on, I'll be happy. Or maybe if I buy something, I'll be happy, you know? Retail therapy. Yeah, I had a friend who every time he was depressed, he'd go buy a TV. I don't know how many TVs he had, but you always knew when he was depressed because he just bought another TV. Um, that's somehow, Rhonda's not here today, I can talk about her. <laughs> shoes. Lots and lots of shoes. Yeah. Some people think they're going to be happy if they just have a baby, or if they just get a puppy, or if they just accumulate enough wealth, um, or if they could just have the right relationship, the right person in their life. And it doesn't matter if you manage to actually accomplish any of those things in your life, you find at some point, once again, you're not happy. It's a fleeting, circumstantial thing. And so we search. We want to find a lasting happiness. We want to get happy, and we want to stay happy. But the truth is that for every up, there is a down. Every single time. In fact, we're told we won't even understand what an up is if we haven't experienced a down, right? It's the downs that make the ups happiness. If it were an absolute even keel, we wouldn't know an up from a down. 
King Solomon, he had arrived, if you will. He was the king of Israel. Uh, in that passage I read to you, um, he mentions uh, many things that he thought would bring him happiness. Uh, he mentions wine three times. He mentions women eight times. He mentions song eight times. He mentions cattle seven times, sheep seven times, silver he mentions eight times, gold he mentions eight times. He mentions concubines. Uh, the estimates are that he had between 300 and 700 wives. I never could handle one, so I don't know how you do that. He decided to indulge himself with every possible pleasure that he could imagine. In fact, he says that, that I uh, deny myself nothing. Nothing he could think of did he deny himself. And then he built things. Um, I don't know about you, but building things is my therapy. You know, I like to make things with my hand because then I can stand back and actually see my accomplishment. Um, that's a little harder in ministry to know if you're really making a difference or not. But when I build something with my hand, and he did, he built temples, he built mansions, he built pools and gardens, uh, so many different things. And in verse 11, he says, all he had done was in vain. He hated life. Hated life. Solomon discovered, I think, that happiness is not what he was looking for. What he was looking for was joy. Joy, uh, this deeper experience of happiness, a lasting experience of happiness. Now, the thing about joy is that it connects us to something that's greater than ourselves. That's how we experience joy, is that connection. Joy moves our focus from ourselves to others. This is the most important point uh, in the sermon, so I'm going to repeat it. Joy moves our focus from ourselves to others. Now, in that passage in Solomon, who was Solomon talking about? The whole passage, Solomon was talking about Solomon, my name. Yeah. His focus was entirely on himself. If you want joy, you stop focusing on yourself and you start focusing on others. Joy, true joy, can be felt in good times and bad times. And to have joy requires something else, and that is called faith. So, Solomon learns the source of true joy is God. And for us to experience that joy, we must serve him. Uh, you know, there's rewards on earth, and there's rewards in heaven. Uh, and Solomon even talked about that. All the rewards on earth he deemed were all meaningless, a chasing after the wind. There's something else that goes with joy that's really important in our lives, and that is peace. One of the great things about joy is when we are truly experiencing it, we are also at peace. Now, peace is an amazing thing. It's something that I often pray for with people that are going through a hard time. I pray that they'll have the peace that transcends understanding. Have you heard those words before? transcend. It rises above understanding. It's the peace that doesn't make sense. It's the peace that my brother had when he moved three times his entire family in one year for his job. He was about to move the third time, and so I, I drove to Maryland and I, I, to, to help him pack up his entire house and move his family for the third time in one year. 
And I had this expectation of what would be on his face and how he would be feeling and how he would be suffering. And you know what? He was fine. He was just fine. Just got a job to do. We'll do it. We'll get her done. We'll move. I said, how? I didn't understand how. This is the thing that transcends understanding. People look at you and say, with all you're going through, how can you be so calm? How can you not be grieving? How can you have peace in the midst of these circumstances? It's because joy and the accompanying peace doesn't have anything to do with circumstances. It's independent of circumstances. It comes from an inner light that God gives you when he dwells within you. The peace that transcends understanding. Now here's the thing that will bring you peace because sometimes it's it's one thing just to say, God will give you peace, you know, and we walk out of here and we think, how? You know, what can I do? Do I just ask God for peace? Well, how am I going to get this joy that uh, Pastor Chris says I can get? <laughs> you know, this is a, something that even the secular world has figured out. It's an amazing thing. Well, every once in a while, you hear uh, things in the secular world and you say, yeah, that's right. It comes from God, though, and they don't know that. They think it's their own wisdom. If you go to counseling and you're suffering loss, pain, uh, any kind of emotional trauma, um, the counselor's going to give you one piece of advice. It's not always easy to follow this advice, by the way, but it's really good advice. You're gonna say, you know, you need to do something with your time. You need to go volunteer somewhere. Have you ever been told that? When you're grieving or hurting? You need to go volunteer somewhere. Go help serve meals in the hot food kitchen. Go help with the food pantry. Uh, go, Help at the hospital as a volunteer. Uh, go into your elementary school and volunteer to read to the kids. You need to go do some volunteer work sometime. Now, why would a secular counselor tell you that? When you focus on yourself, you're not going to have joy, folks. It's just not going to be there that happiness that you try so hard to get and to hang on to, it goes through your fingers like sand and it's gone. But when you focus on other people, the joy comes and it remains. You sleep so good at night, knowing that you did a wonderful thing today, even though it may have been hard work. Joy is found in your labors when you're doing God's work. And when you are focused on another person, you are doing God's work. That's exactly what he asks from him, from us. Feed my people. Yeah. Tell people about me. Do my work in this world. And you'll find joy. And when we find joy... We can truly rest. Rest after work is joy-filled when that work involves doing God's will. The world offers happiness, but it's short, it's fleeting, it's non-satisfying. God offers joy. It's permanent in good times and bad, and it's there whenever we're focused on others. God bless.